European Union members are supposed to be on the same page when it comes to issues like foreign policy and political values. But have global tensions actually highlighted that there is a genuine divide between the East and the West of the bloc? Welcome to the program. I'm Philip Hampshire. Europe is having to come to terms with the idea that on issues like Russia, China, relations with Washington and even immigration, keeping all 27 members of the EU together is a major undertaking. For example, former Soviet states and those who fell under the control of Moscow during the Cold War tend to demand a hard line against Russia, while big Western powers like Germany and France are much more likely to publicly call for bridges to be built. And calls from the likes of France's President Emmanuel Macron for Europe to become more independent of Washington appear to horrify strongly pro-American nations like Poland and the Baltic states. So how serious is this divide? Or is it just an exaggeration to claim it's a major issue? Joining me to discuss this today in Skopje in Macedonia, we have Simonida Kakaska, who is the director of the European Policy Institute. Meanwhile, in Rome, we have Thomas Fazi, who's a journalist. While in Belgrade, in Serbia, we have Strahinja Subotic, who is a researcher at the European Policy Center. And in Warsaw, in Poland, we have Adam Yasser, who's deputy managing editor of Visegrad Insight and former advisor to the former Prime Minister Donald Tusk. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining me. Uh, Simonida, if I start with you, um, is there a we an East-West split in Europe? Let's, let's attack the premise of the question first. Is there a split East-West in Europe? And if so, is it getting bigger or smaller? Thank you for that. Um, I think the East-West divide has been essential to the way that Europe has been imagining itself, at least uh, in our lifetime and many uh, centuries before this. Uh, we, uh, you've mentioned here that we have Rome, Skopje, uh, Warsaw and Belgrade, and probably in the traditional way that we see this was divide, Rome would be on, uh, on the western side, whereas the others would be on the eastern side. Though with the European Union enlargement, one can also contest that now Warsaw has also moved to the, to the west. So I would say that for many of us, the east-west divide is still very present. The war, the aggression in Ukraine has actually uh, moved, going back to your second question, the East-West divide probably to the boundaries of Ukraine. But this is very much in flux. We are living through this moment. And it's likely to strengthen this division and to move it to, um, to a different geographical boundary. But I think that in our lifetimes, we are likely going to experience it much more. And it will be with us uh, uh, as, as a divide to continue. Well, let me take you uh, across to uh, Adam next. Adam, um, do you feel that there's an east-west split? And do you think it's growing? Well, the East-West split has obviously some historical reasons. And, um, you know, Central and Eastern Europe was able to rejoin democratic Europe only relatively recently. So obviously there is some historical uh, background to this. Um, at the moment, uh, in fact, I would argue the opposite, that there is more of consolidation in Europe, even if countries have... Um, sometimes different perspectives on, on things such as war on Ukraine. Um, the level of unity that Europe is able to display is actually quite uh, surprising. Um, and also, I think it is important to notice that uh, within Central and Eastern Europe, there are different division lines. Uh, so uh, dividing it uh, along East-West um, line is, is just an oversimplification. Strahinja, you agree with that? I would actually agree that this is an unprecedented level of solidarity that we are now witnessing among member states. If we take a look at the pandemic when it started a few years back, we originally saw that the individual member states were looking at their national selfish interests at the beginning, and later on they developed a joint procurement and procured the vaccines and other medical equipment. And now we saw that right from the beginning of the war in Ukraine, 
uh, each and every member state, including uh, 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 countries such as uh, Hungary, uh, have offer, offered a sign of support uh, to Ukraine and uh, have agreed on multiple sanctioning, uh, sanctioning packages uh, in a quite uh, relatively short period of time. However, later on, we saw that this unity is not as solid as originally uh, believed, and uh, some cracks uh, are now getting more and more uh, visible, although this is not uh, completely de destroying the concept of unity in the EU, at least not for the time being. Adam, I'm going to go very slightly further than Strahinia there and say that while there was a lot of cohesion and uh, uh, Europe was coming together, as it were, throughout the COVID pandemic and with the war in Ukraine initially. Prior to the COVID pandemic, the European Union seemed to be quite regularly taking a stick to Poland, also taking a stick to uh, Hungary. It also seemed, uh, while complaining about Russian interference in European elections, also seemed to uh, really target politicians that they didn't necessarily like the politics of uh, or didn't feel that they necessarily reflected the way the European Union wanted things done in various different countries across uh, Eastern Europe. Do you not think that that's the case or do you think that that's an unfair characterization? You're absolutely right. Some tensions between uh, some Central European countries and uh, their partners in the Western part have emerged or had emerged uh, before the war and they centered around something that uh, in Poland and Hungary was described as a cultural revolution uh, that these two countries wanted to, um, to conduct and to persuade other Western partners to join. This cultural revolution was primarily meant as a challenge to the um, established um, principles of Western community, rule of law, um, freedom of the media, and to turn it more into what Viktor Orban, the leader of Hungary, used to call um, uh, illiberal democracy. So there was a bit of an ideological divide uh, between Poland and Hungary and the rest uh, of, the, uh, of the EU partners, and uh, it was followed by very specific steps in both countries to limit the freedom of the press, to subjugate the judiciary, and that, uh, over time, uh, provoked a, a reaction from EU partners, not just the Commission, not just Brussels, as they say, but also from, from partners. And then the Commission felt reluctantly obliged uh, to ensure that the EU treaties are being observed by these two countries. So it's a chicken and egg uh, discussion uh, but I think it's pretty clear where the egg is and who's the chicken. Thomas, let's look at the situation in Italy, almost always regarded, of course, traditionally as part of Western Europe. Nonetheless, at the moment, there does seem to be somewhat of a political shift there where um, Georgia Maloney, now that she's been elected as uh, leader of the country, she settled in and everyone seems happy. But in the run-up to that, the European Union didn't seem too happy about her appointment. It, it had rhymes and echoes of the situation in perhaps Hungary and Poland, didn't it? Well, <clears throat> um, Maloney has actually proven to be... Uh, um, uh, you know, very, very harmless, uh, I would say, in the eyes of the establishment. Uh, she's gone along with the uh, uh, the foreign policy uh, strategy, uh, the NATO foreign policy strategy in Ukraine, and she's been very obedient uh, with regards to um, uh, the EU's economic framework. And so I think Maloney has learned the lesson of the uh, 2018 uh, five-star league government, which didn't last too long, which is that, you know, if you try to challenge the European Union, uh, especially if you if you if you're inside the euro, um, your chances of survival aren't um, aren't very good. And so I think she's just uh, she, she's doing all that she knows she can do to remain um, to remain in power. Uh, that's the, that's what you get when you're in a country that uh, you know has really relegated all the major economic uh, levers to uh, to the European Union. Uh, Italy doesn't have much of a choice but to go along with what the European Union says and to a large degree with what NATO says when it comes to foreign policy, considering that we have a sizable amount of uh, uh, US forces and US military bases uh, still uh, in Italy, uh, 80 years, almost 80 years after the end of uh, World War II. So, you know, Italy isn't an, enti an entirely sovereign country. 
uh, Simonita, if I take it across to you, um, what Thomas is saying there, those kinds of uh, arguments that he's been placing forward, aren't those similar to the kinds of arguments that we've been hearing out of some of the, say, V4 countries in Central and Eastern Europe? You could say so, because actually, I mean, going back to the way that we've discussed Europe, going back to your initial question and the East-West divide, it's kind of can become synonymous in most of the replies with the European Union. And this goes back to your question now of the of the V4, you know. Strachinia and myself come from countries that are outside of the European Union. So when I, I respond to Europe, it's a much different concept than we are all that we are discussing. So let's uh, just just to keep it just to keep in mind that the East in Europe might be also be referred to the Balkans and partly now to the to the new EU member states. The um, responsibilities and the tasks that have been relegated to the EU, is it, uh, con uh, is it uh, how much is it constraining sovereignty in many of the economic policies? You could hear these arguments now, but uh, this is a this has been a perpetual uh, element of the European accession process of the European integration process. So um, in this sense, I would not go in treating also the V4 countries who are part of the new EU member states that we, we should not even be saying anymore EU as the exception. And I'm very glad that actually uh, Italy has been mentioned because these debates go across old member states, go across the states that have actually recently joined and not among, not along the line. This is not a dividing line in that sense. Stranya, how does a split within Europe affect Europe's relations with uh, the other major powers in the world, whether it's Russia, whether it's China, whether it's the United States, in your opinion? Unfortunately, we still don't have a single phone, phone number to, to ring it when we're deciding who to call when it comes to uh, European Union's foreign policy. We should simply take a look at uh, how uh, you engaged in its foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis China. We had Ursula von der Leyen visiting alongside uh, Macron. Uh, although they agree on many issues and work together, we saw very different tones and very different rhetoric and very different uh, uh, comments. Of course, in this, uh, among this uh, duo, Macron uh, took the front stage and uh, overshadowed uh, Ursula von der Leyen's uh, uh, purpose uh, in her visit to, to uh, uh, China. So here we saw that uh, member states are actually still the ones who uh, drive uh, foreign policy. And of course, Macron, as a leader who is actually envisioning himself as a, a, a key uh, a boost to future reforms uh, in the European Union, he also believes that he can drive uh, EU's foreign policy besides internal policies. And therefore, his comments on the European uh, strategic autonomy, European sovereignty, uh, although they were shocking to some, should not have been surprising because he has kept saying this even before the war in Ukraine started, that the EU should be capable, regardless of the United States or anybody else, to put itself on its feet to, to act as a relevant a geostrategic player uh, in the world. We saw Annalena Berkut, uh, German uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, visiting uh, China. Uh, she did not endorse Macron's uh, vision, but uh, she didn't attack uh, uh, Macron uh, general. Well, let, balance let me itself. take that across to Adam, if I can, because, Adam, you were an advisor to Donald Tusk. So um, if we're going to say that Eastern Europe, uh, whether it's Poland or, or which particular areas of Eastern Europe, but Poland in particular, uh, view their relationship with the United States as slightly stronger than we've seen, seen coming out of France. Take Macron's recent comments when he went to China and he was sort of commenting about the fact that Europe needs to find a new strategic way, which wouldn't go down very well in quite a large section of Eastern Europe, I would imagine. Well, perhaps in Hungary it would. Um, I don't know. Uh, but, but seriously, um, you know, I would not exaggerate the, the role of these differences. They obviously are there, and, and certainly Poland is much more um, eager to keep U.S. presence in Europe, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, but I think sometimes the French position is misunderstood. You know, when, when the French talk, and this is nothing new, it's, it's been a theme since the Gulf, that, uh, that Europe needs to be able to act independently or autonomously, if you will, that does not necessarily mean getting rid of the US. I think what the French are saying is that Europe needs to be prepared for an eventuality that the US goes back to its isolationist mode or focuses 
so much on China that it can no longer provide security to Europe, in which case Europe needs to take care of its own yard. And incidentally, you know, the Americans have been saying this to Europeans for uh, 20 years now, you know, saying the peace dividend, yes, you've consumed that, but now you need to be able to look after your own backyard. And of course, what the war in Ukraine has revealed is that Europe is unable to, um, uh, to, to, um, to look after its own backyard. And the Americans were, again, necessary. So France's position, actually, you know, if you remember, there was a moment where President Macron said, you know, NATO is brain dead. And then after the war in Ukraine, he said, NATO is back. So, you know, you have to be careful to distill some of the more colorful rhetoric coming from Macron um, uh, from actual policy. And let me address just one issue which you raised earlier um, about, you know, the balancing act between sovereignty and pooling resources. The European Union is about this balancing act. And you cannot expect at the same time full unity and preservation of sovereign uh, sovereign sovereignty, uh, national sovereignty to, to, the, to the top limit. This is just a contradiction in terms. This is, the European Union is about maintaining peace, cooperation, the single market, and as part of that, you have to surrender part of your sovereignty. The question how much and how you ensure unity and how you ensure coherence, this is the challenge. Thomas. There seems to be this split in Europe. Do we love Americans? Do we like Americans but want to keep them at arm's length? Or do we secretly not like Americans very much and we actually want to get back to being Europeans? And nobody in Europe seems to have a satisfactory answer that satisfies everyone. So where do you stand on this and where does Italy stand? Well, I mean, what I, what I would want doesn't count that much. I personally uh, agree with Macron. Uh, I think Europe is way too dependent on the United States, is way too dependent on NATO, uh, especially in the context of this new Cold War that the US is ramping up vis-a-vis uh, -vis China and the China-led bloc. Uh, I think that's a, a bloc which now encompasses uh, much, of the, much, of the, much of the world. And Italy and Europe more in general uh, should engage uh, with uh, with the non-Western bloc, with the China-led bloc, it shouldn't antagonize it, uh, which is what remaining tied to the U.S. entails, uh, I'm afraid. But I think, you know, uh, talking about European strategic autonomy, I think it, it underscores the fact that there is no Europe to, to, to speak of. I mean, there is no single uh, common geopolitical interest that can bring together all the European countries, uh, just like there wasn't one single coherent economic interest, uh, you know, bringing together Germany and Italy. And in fact, we've seen that in the economic sphere increase the divergence between countries, uh, you know, the, what, now we're talking about the east-west divide, but up until a few years ago, we were talking about the north-south divide, which has characterized much of the uh, past decade, and the increased divergence between the German-led bloc and the countries of periphery, especially of the Mediterranean. And so I think we risk replicating that, you know, I would say negative dynamic in the geopolitical sphere now. You know, we, we're, we're trying to find some common uh, position, but that's not possible. Uh, because they are, we have very divergent uh, positions, uh, divergent uh, perceptions of the conflict in Ukraine, divergent perceptions of Russia and of the kind of relationship we should have with Russia, and divergent, uh, you know, somewhat predetermined geostrategic interests, which have to do with, you know, uh, you, you know, countries' economic models, their even simply their geographic position, and I think, you know, and this is a true divide. Uh, I appreciate the other guests' attempt to, you know, downplay this divide, but I think this divide is real. It's very, it, it's fundamental, and I think it'll uh, it'll lead to uh, uh, to you know uh, very serious cracks in the European Union in the coming uh, years, if not uh, if not months. Uh, and so I think it simply confirms that the European Union um, is a, is a bad idea. Bringing together countries that have uh, heterogeneous, very different, even conflicting uh, economic models, geostrategic interests, uh, so social values, and trying to uh, kind of flatten <laughs> all those differences. Uh, it, it doesn't work. And in fact, it leads to heightened tensions and heightened divisions, which is the opposite of what the European Union uh, should do. And so well, I think let me, uh, just... 
Thomas, I take your I take your point there. Adam, let me take that across to you. Thomas is worried that you're trying to make homogenous what is in fact essentially heterogeneous, and there isn't too much to connect these countries together. Well, I I, I find this argument very strange. I, I I would like to see some evidence of this uh, divergence. Uh, at the moment, what we see is convergence. But uh, the the Euro project has survived many years, and actually we have a natural experiment of Brexit, which shows you how much you can achieve alone if you leave the single market. Um, you know, Brexit was supposed to bring prosperity and wealth and independent sovereign policy making to the United Kingdom. And what we see is that it actually brought economic misery, uh, loss of influence on the global stage and, uh, and, uh, and losing access to, um, uh, to a single market of 400 million people. So I'm not entirely sure if Italy would indeed uh, benefit so much if it, uh, if it left the EU. Uh, I think Italy would actually struggle a lot. Uh, that's one point. And the second point is I don't quite understand how you can, uh, in the same breath, argue for, for, for the French concept of strategic European autonomy and at the same time claim that Europe is diverging. Um, that would be a neat trick to combine divergence and sliding back towards nationalism with exercising um, autonomic strategy for Europe. It's just to me that, incompatible. That's point. You can't have strategy. You can't have economic strategy for Europe as a whole. Uh, the concept makes no sense. I agree that there are certain countries, uh, Italy, France, Germany, which would benefit from greater autonomy and from greater and um, from less reliance in the US. But I think if they want that, they will have to go at it alone because Acquiring that greater strategic autonomy in the context of the European Union is well, simply impossible. We had a history of going it alone, you know, of all these countries going alone. And we had bloody wars for several centuries. We had the First World War, which was a disaster for the countries you're mentioning. We had the Second World War, which was a disaster for Central and Eastern Europe, for the Jewish population uh, across the continent, uh, and, and ended in, in unspeakable misery. So, you know, I'm not Adam, entirely sure Adam, that let going me, back let to nationalism is, is actually a recipe for Europe as a project, uh, building prosperity and peace uh, has been pretty successful. Adam, uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid, not let, to me, say that there are no problems, let me bring in the other guest, no Simonida. Issues, but so far, so yeah. good. Simonida. Uh, yes. I'm assuming your position on this is also uh, closer to Adam's here uh, than it would be to Thomas's. However, Thomas is correct. Over the course of the last 20 years, Italy has seen a good deal of divergence away from the European economic me mean, as everybody else seems to have got wealthier. Italy has not got wealthier at the same pace, is certainly a true statement to make about the country's economy. Absolutely. And uh, Italy has struggled with productivity over for a very long time and for having a meaningful uh, growth of their economy. But I would be also very of actually uh, attaching this fully to the faults of the European to the faults of the European project, also coming from a region Unfortunately, the, which has tended to go, uh, in which countries have tended to go their own separate ways, and uh, actually they have diverged and they have from the European model very much, and uh, they are struggling to compete with the level that the European the, of uh, development that the European Union has uh, experienced. Um, unfortunately, you know, having lived through some uh, recent events, in uh, going back to what Adam was saying of the last centuries, we had wars here uh, about 30 years ago. And having seen the experience of the transformation that this model provided for some of the new EU member states, you would really find it difficult for me to actually have any different position than, on this than what, uh, what Adam put forward. Strahinya, I'm very sorry. We only have a little bit of time left. Let me have your comment on this. Building upon what Simonida said, I'd like to say that uh, this war in Ukraine actually allowed member states to overcome their divisions uh, on enlargement or actually to work on overcoming their uh, divisions. Before, it was Eastern Europeans who were in favor of enlargement, whereas the Western Europeans were against it or were more skeptical about it, whereas now 
we as a think tank and uh, our colleagues in the region are inc increasingly being approached by uh, member states such as Netherlands, uh, France and Germany to ask for original proposals uh, that could actually enable Western Balkans to uh, jump in and, and become members of the club uh, in a more merit-based but also a gradual uh, way in terms of allowing them to participate in EU institutions even before membership is acquired, including a potential for uh, further furthering the, the economic cooperation. All of these ideas, of course, could be applied to potentially to Ukraine and other candidate countries as well. So I'm hopeful that uh, at least uh, from this horrible experience in Ukraine, we can actually expect Europe to converge when it comes to at least the enlargement policy, which has been long used, most successful uh, policy. Strahinia, thank you very much for that. Simon, Ida, Thomas, Adam, all four of you, thank you very much for joining me. I'm afraid that's all we have time for on the show. If you want to see more discussion and debate, though, head on over to our YouTube channel. You'll find us there if you search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me here and the entire team, thank you for watching and goodbye.